In recent years, it seems as though Game Freak has been under greater scrutiny when it comes to the way that they monetize their games. Yes, it could be worse, I mean, I play Overwatch 2, I, I know, but the major complaint in recent gens has to be the fact that the competitive scene is being squeezed to get access to the most powerful Pokemon that are locked behind a DLC paywall. Yes, these Pokemon aren't necessarily mandatory to compete at events, but if we're being totally honest here, the results show that these Pokemon perform better at high-level competitive play. I've already resigned myself to the fate of giving them money whenever they release a new Scrimbo Blimbo that can set up Trick Room by switching in, but not everyone is okay with this. Today, I want to talk about the various pay-to-win Pokemon. Now, that's a real simple way of putting it. Like I said, you don't need to drop money on the DLC if you can play well enough or build a strong team without these Pokemon, but it's certainly the easiest way to describe this phenomenon. If you enjoyed this video at any point in time, be sure to leave a like and subscribe because I upload tons of competitive Pokemon content just like this and I'm on my way to 500,000 subscribers. Actually, you should totally just subscribe right now because I have a playlist full of videos just like this for you to binge right after this one. This video is sponsored by Manscaped.com, the global men's lifestyle brand that's revolutionizing the landscape of men's grooming. As a competitive gamer, I find myself traveling a lot and meeting with tons of people at events. Manscaped offers men's grooming products that make sure I look my best no matter where I go. Manscaped sent me their Performance Package 5.0 Ultra, featuring their all-new Lawnmower 5.0 Ultra electric trimmer. With this thing's skin-safe blade heads, I don't need to worry at all about nicks or cuts when I use it. Also included in the package is their Weed Whacker 2.0, which I've especially found a lot of use out of. This thing comfortably lets me trim my nose hairs instead of tearing up whenever I gotta pluck one that's getting way too long. When you order the Performance Package 5.0 Ultra, you'll receive a free gift. Like I said, I'm on the road a lot these days, so the gift of the Shed 2.0 toiletry bag was sick, cause now I can take these wherever I go. It'll fit everything in the package, including their Crop Soother and Crop Preserver that will keep you feeling cool and comfortable all day long. So what are you waiting for? Join the 9 million men worldwide who use Manscaped for their grooming and hygiene needs. Head over to manscaped.com to get your hands on the Lawnmower 5.0 Ultra, and when you use my code MOXIE at checkout, you'll get 20% off free international shipping and two free gifts. Once again, that's code MOXIE at checkout for 20% off free international shipping and two free gifts. Thank you to Manscaped for sponsoring this video. We should start with the origins of DLC. If you only somehow got into Pokemon with the Nintendo Switch era of games, you've never experienced the third game release. Basically, ever since Gen 1, Game Freak has released a third version of every generation's games that has some kind of upgrading graphics and access to certain new items or Pokemon. Examples of this being Pokemon Yellow for Gen 1, Pokemon Crystal for Gen 2, Pokemon Emerald for Gen 3, Pokemon Platinum for Gen 4, Pokemon Black 2 and White 2 for Gen 5, and Pokemon Ultra Sun and Ultra Moon for Gen 7. Gen 6 didn't get a third version or a sequel game but Omega Ruby and Alpha Sapphire effectively filled this role as they included new Megas. Pokemon Ultra Sun and Ultra Moon were arguably the straw that broke the camel's back when it came to third versions. These games had largely the same story as Sun and Moon, with only minor changes and only introduced four new Pokemon in Ultra Necrozma, Lycanroc Dusk, Lacephalon, and Stack Attacka. Along with this, they introduced a few new exclusive Z-moves for Pokemon like Lycanroc and Kamoa. What really made these games unique compared to the others was the combination of the fact that the story had hardly changed and that the newly introduced Pokemon were not in the code of the previous versions. This meant that in order to compete in tournaments in 2018 and 2019, VGC players had to purchase and complete Pokemon Ultra Sun and Ultra Moon, despite all the new content being small enough to fit in a DLC to Sun and Moon if Game Freak really wanted to. Going forward, Game Freak decided to just update the games with DLC instead of releasing a whole new game. With this, we saw the Isle of Armor and Crown Tundra DLC in Pokemon Sword and Shield. Along with this DLC came the first big red flag, Urshifu. Urshifu is a Pokemon that embodies the very concept of power creep perfectly. It came in two forms, Single Strike and Rapid Strike. Urshifu Single Strike was a dark and fighting type with some pretty phenomenal stats, including 130 attack and 97 speed. These stats are great, but it'd be nothing special had it not been for its signature ability and move. Unseen Fist is the signature ability of the Urshifu forms. This simply allows for contact moves to bypass protect. While not being terribly complicated, this ability absolutely ruins any form of defensive play in Pokemon. Some less competitively minded viewers might believe that defensive play always means stall. This isn't true, especially in VGC. Players will often click protect and switch in a partner Pokemon to end up in a better position for the next turn to try to make some headway in the match and maybe pick up a KO. Urshifu ignoring protect across the board means that this form of defensive play simply doesn't work in the face of it. While absurdly powerful, it wouldn't be nearly as much of an issue had Urshifu's signature moves not trash the other form of defensive play someone can go for. Intimidate and screens are a way to cut the damage output coming from the opponent 
opponent, allowing you to, once again, try to position your Pokemon in a more advantageous way. Urshifu Single Strike has access to the move Wicked Blow, a dark type move that upon release was 80 base power and always dealt a critical hit. Urshifu Rapid Strike, the water type variant, had the signature move Surging Strikes, a 25 base power water move which always crit and hit 3 times. Critical hits ignore all stat drops from the user, defense boost from the target, and screens, meaning that not only can you not protect against Urshifu, but you can't decrease the damage in any way other than burning Urshifu or using Wo Chen, baby! Oh yeah, this is a certified Tablets of Ruin moment. If you didn't run Wo Chen at every regional in 2023, you can't sit with us. Point is, these Pokemon were insanely powerful and stuck behind the paywall of the Sword and Shield expansion pack. Now, these Pokemon were actually nerfed in Generation 9. Well, actually only Single Strike was. Wicked Blow went from 80 base power down to 75, but that doesn't do much when the moves still bypass Protect and deal critical hits. They're also not currently available to be caught in Generation 9, which means they have to be transferred from Pokemon Home, which is another paywall, from a copy of Sword and Shield that have the DLC. Yes, you can get these Pokemon via trading, but if we assume a world where everyone gets their Pokemon legitimately, like how Game Freak attends for the game to be played, people aren't going to be too keen on trading away their $30 bear. But where Urshifu could hypothetically be traded to another player, the next Pokemon blocks that in a very cheeky way. Calyrex is the legendary Pokemon that on face value is really really bad. A grass psychic type with stats so low that you wouldn't bother to use it even if no one else could run legendaries is a really weird Pokemon to block behind a paywall, right? Well, technically this little dude can be traded. What can't be traded is the key item, the Reigns of Unity. This item allows for Calyrex to be fused with the two other paywalled Pokemon in this DLC. <laughs> Spectrier and Glacier. Spectrier? Glace, Glacier? I'm gonna say it like stupid. I'm gonna say Spectrier and Glacier. I know, I don't know how to pronounce it, just I know that some people pronounce it different. They're the horses that within lore Calyrex rode when it ruled over the Crown Tundra. Individually, they're both formidable legendary Pokemon. Spectrier boasts a base 130 speed stat with 145 special attack as a pure ghost type. It's super frail, but during the Gen 8 VGC meta for a few formats, it was a pretty huge threat. The ability Grim Nay meant that if Spectrier managed to score a KO, it'd have its special attack stat increased by one stage, allowing for it to snowball and sweep through teams. Dynamax was a big reason it was viable though, as it lacked real coverage moves other than Mudshot and Snarl, so Max Quake and Max Darkness made up for the lack of options other than Shadow Ball. Meanwhile, Glacier was a powerful Ice type, which asked the question, what if Ice types weren't bad? With 145 attack, great bulk, a low speed of 30, and good coverage options, Glacier was a menace in Gen 8 VGC for a couple of formats. It was a terrifying weakness policy user, who was also able to snowball its attack stat with its ability to Chilling Nay. It was a staple of Trick Room teams and was practically everywhere for a while. But what these Pokemon can do individually has nothing on what they can do when the Reigns of Unity are used to fuse them with Calyrex. <sighs> Okay, now we get into the real meat and potatoes of the pay-to-win Pokemon. Calyrex Ice Rider and Shadow Rider were two of the most powerful restricted Pokemon in VGC 2022 Series 12. Starting with Ice Rider, we have a powerful Trick Room Sweeper with one of the most busted abilities of all time. As one combines the abilities of Calyrex and whichever horse it's riding into one super ability. This ability, by the way, also couldn't be turned off by neutralizing gas. In Ice Rider's case, it has both Unnerve and Chilling Nay. This meant that not only did Calyrex Ice's attack boost with every KO, it took, but the opponents were unable to eat berries. Berries were an essential part of Gen 8 VGC teams. Due to Dynamax granting all Pokemon much stronger coverage moves during the Dynamax turns, one of the safest ways to ensure your Pokemon were able to survive all three turns of those was by equipping them with either Recovery Berries or Damage Reduction Berries. Occasionally, you'd see the likes of a Shuka Berry or Babiri Berry to allow for Incineroar to eat a Max Quake or Togekiss to eat a Max Steel Spike, but with Unnerve active, these berries would simply never be consumed by the opponents, limiting defensive play versus both Calyrex forms. And defense Defensive play is necessary for surviving against this thing. With absurd stats like 100 HP, 165 attack, 150 defense, and 130 special defense, this thing was able to tank nearly every hit and one-shot opponents with its signature move that had no drawbacks. Upon Gen 8's release, the move Glacial Lance was a 130 base power ice move that hit both opponents. It was nerfed in Generation 9 down to 120 base power, but when you compare it to moves like Groudon's Precipice Blades, this becomes pretty ridiculous on its face. Precipice Blades is a 120 base power ground move which hits both opponents but is only 85 accuracy. When you count for the chance to miss and the fact that ground moves can't hit flying types, giving Calyrex Ice a no drawback move that was originally stronger than Precipice Blades is 
pretty insane. Where other Pokemon in this generation like Zacian had to hold an item to become its busted form, Calyrex is free to hold whatever item it wanted, from safety goggles to avoid spore, to babiri berries to live hits from opposing Zacian. And this thing got even more ridiculous in its ghost form. Calyrex Shadow Rider was the more popular of the two, due to its high speed not necessitating Trick Room like the Ice Rider form did. And the fact it was a special attacking ghost type meant not only did it not fear Fake Out, but it didn't mind Intimidate either. Its version of As One once again combined Unnerve with the horse's ability, this one being Grim Nay. Its ability to outspeed Zacian with its 150 base speed made it especially dangerous as not only could Max Phantasms coming off a 165 base special attack KO many Pokemon instantly, but because Max Phantasm dropped both opponents' defensive stats, its partner Zacian or Groudon could easily follow up for a KO with their slower but powerful physical attacks. Caloric Shadow was the more dangerous of the two due to its ease of cleaning up games. Choice Specs became the preferred set among many players since Boosted Astral Barrage, a no drawback base 120 special ghost move that hit both opponents, could snag two KOs against even resisted Pokemon. Then, its special attack would increase by two stages due to the ability Grimnay, and it would proceed to KO whatever was in the back if it was slower than it. This thing's existence was only truly checked by its times 4 weakness to Ghost and Dark. This meant that it could be threatened by opposing Calyrex, Sucker Punches, and shut down by Incineroar Snarl Spam. It's easily the most broken Pokemon Game Freak released into VGC behind a paywall, and it was the whole reason I decided to make this video. Regieleki and Regidrago are yet another pair of Pokemon locked behind Sword and Shield's second DLC. While Drago was a fairly strong Pokemon in Gen 8 VGC, it wasn't nearly as powerful as Regieleki and didn't find itself on many teams. Regieleki became the face of speed control and hyper offense in Generation 8. While it did boast the highest speed stat of all time in 200, it also had a broken ability in Transistor. This ability gave Regieleki a 50% boost to whichever stat it was using to attack as long as it was using an electric type move. Regidrago had the same ability in Generation 8, but it was Dragon's Maw, which only worked with dragon moves. Regieleki was able to deal chunks of damage to both opponents while lowering their speed with Electroweb, allowing for its partners to outspeed the likes of Zacian and Calyrex and score KOs. While at first Regieleki was mostly a speed control Pokemon, players soon found out how busted Aleki could be offensively. It was possible for a Dynamax Life Orb Regieleki to one-shot a Zacian with Max Lightning, which is a neutral attack versus it. The very idea of a box legendary being one-shot by a neutral attack coming off of a base 100 stat just does doesn't feel right. It downright felt illegal, actually. And someone at Game Freak must have agreed because in Gen 9, Regieleki's ability transistor was nerfed to just a 1.3 times boost. Meanwhile, Regidrago's ability remained completely untouched. This was unprecedented. Regieleki was so busted that Game Freak nerfed it without touching its underperforming counterpart, a courtesy not granted to Zamazenta for some reason. I'd normally include the Pokemon Legends Arceus exclusives here as well, but since they're not limited to just one per game, I actually don't think they count as a pay-to-win Pokemon. It's super easy to get one traded to you nowadays. So as far as Gen 9 pay-to-win Pokemon, I'm only going to be counting Ogre Pond, since among the various Teal Mask DLC releases, it's the only one that truly has a stranglehold on the competitive world right now. Ogre Pond is a fairly balanced looking Pokemon at face value. Its stats are actually just pretty good when you take a look at it. Serviceable bulk with a great attack stat, and a speed tier that's just below the forces of nature is never going to be bad, but what really puts it over the top are the mask held items that allow for Ogre Pond to change its form, type, and ability. With the teal mask, Ogre Pond doesn't have to hold an item, but it doesn't gain a 20% boost to its moves across the board like the other masks would grant. To make up for this, it has the best ability of the four in Defiant, which gives Ogre Pond plus two attack anytime its stats are lowered. This means that it's an anti-intimidate Pokemon, which is pretty solid in VGC. While teal mask isn't a super popular pick at the time of writing this video, Jamie Boyt recently took a Scope Lens set to top 4 of Toronto Regionals. Scope Lens is a pretty great item for Ogre Pond because it pairs well with its signature move Ivy Cudgel. This is a physical grass type move which makes no contact with the opponent and has a high crit rate. When you combine Scope Lens's crit rate with Ivy Cudgel's crit rate, this means that Ivy Cudgel will crit 50% of the time, and Ogre Pond's ability changing to Embody Aspect means that this thing could take KOs it really shouldn't be able to. Embody Aspect is the signature ability of Ogre Pond when it terrestrializes. Depending on the form it has, Ogre Pond will gain a boost to one of its stats. In the Teal Mask's case, it's Speed, which allows for this thing to just magically start outspeeding and KOing Fluttermane and Chen Pao. As for the other masks, they're actually far more popular due to their immediate damage increase from the held item. Like I said, the masks grant Ogre Pond a 20% boost to all of its moves, but they also change the type of Ivy Cudgel to whatever the corresponding type of the mask is, 
and grant Ogre Pond a brand new ability. The Cornerstone Mask grants Ogre Pond Rock Typing, the ability Sturdy, and a defense boost when it terrestrializes. The Wellspring Mask grants it the Water Typing, the ability Water Absorb, and a special defense boost when it terrestrializes. And the Hearth Flame Mask grants it the Fire Typing, Mold Breaker, and an attack boost when it terrestrializes. While Wellspring Ogre Pond is the most common one in VGC due to its combination of good support traits with Follow Me and amazing damage output, the Hearth Flame Mask has already banned in Smog on Singles due to its viability over there. Ogre Pond Hearth Flame is able to set up and sweep whole teams by going for plus one Ivy Cudgel that very few Pokemon are able to switch in on, especially considering Ivy Cudgel can just, you know, randomly crit you. Ogre Pond is a really interesting case in pay to win Pokemon because it's more like four Pokemon in one, with how different all the forms play. They fill totally different roles on whatever team they find themselves on, which makes it an especially valuable Pokemon for competitive players to have access to, and makes it even harder to get via a trade if you're doing everything legitimately. Yes, the Loyal 3 and Ursuline Blood Moon are also locked behind the DLC paywall, but they don't have nearly the level of competitive viability that Ogre Pond has, nor the other Pokemon on this list. But those were various pay-to-win Pokemon competitive players have to get a hold of one way or another. Let me know what you think about them in the comment section down below, and be sure to leave a like and subscribe if you learned anything new. Thanks to all my Patreon supporters and my YouTube channel members for your support, and a special thank you to my most boosted supporters Narwiz, Joseph B, and Kanor for their generous pledges. If you want to see your name at the end of my videos and get bonus content every week, be sure to check out the link to my Patreon page in the description down below, or click the join button below the video to become a member. Thank you all for watching, and I'll see you all in the next video. Bye.